infiltration and ventilation. And you can see these two objects here, zone infiltration, zone ventilation. Actually, there's a third one called zone ventilation, wind and stack open area. Uh, so we're going to talk about these three classes right now. The infiltration class is very simple. It gives the name of the object, the zone it's applied to, the schedule, which we're going to have always on, um, and the design flow rate calculation. In this case, let's just everybody use air changes per hour, which is a pretty easy concept to understand. It, it basically means that if you think of the total volume of space, um, that is um, equal to one air change. So that um, if all of the air is replaced, that is an air change. So how often does that air change happen? That is a measure of volumetric airflow. And so what infiltration is looking at is through all the cracks and leaks and little um, places where air can come and go, um, how often is the interior volume of air replaced? And in a very efficient building, a, a sort of a well-built building that's tightly sealed, you can get as low as about 0.1 air change per hour. More typical modern construction is somewhere around 0.3 uh, air changes per hour. Usually you see commercial construction is a little bit tighter than residential. It also depends a lot on the local building culture and where in the world you are in um, places that have less um, conditioning, particularly less heating, it's more common to see more leaky envelopes. So for instance, um, here on the West Coast, we have much more leaky envelopes than we do on the East Coast where you get colder temperatures. The, uh, this, this building, Worcester Hall, has uh, very leaky envelopes. You can feel it, uh, the air infiltrating in through, particularly through the um, windows. And so I've set here an air change rate of one air change per hour. That's, that's pretty leaky. And so we're getting a lot of unwanted air in, um, both cold and hot, and you'll see dramatic impacts. Now, ventilation is just like infiltration, but it's controlled airflow. And so it works exactly the same way, except that there's a lot more control associated with it. And there's different ways of doing it. The code, in most codes around the world, um, mandate a certain amount of fresh air per person or per area of a building. And um, these codes are more strictly enforced for commercial buildings than for residential, by and large. But uh, you see here there are three objects. And let's look first at this one. This is zone ventilation per person. So what it says is for zone one, it's going to be always on, and their design flow rate method or calculation method is going to be flow per person. So you see here the this number, 0 0.014 cubic meters per second per person. As people come and go, the ventilation will ramp on and off, almost as if it's on an occupancy sensor, or most likely in real buildings, um, it is tied to a carbon dioxide sensor. And so as carbon dioxide levels get higher, then more ventilation air will come on. That um, is an idealized system, but it's one I'd like you to use for this. Another way of thinking about this in a residential setting is that if it starts to get stuffy inside, people will tend to open the windows to let in more air. And so that's another way of thinking about this. Now, in this particular uh, setup, we're controlling this not with windows, but with a fan. And that is, this ventilation type is a, an intake ventilation fan. And you see here the fan efficiency is at 60% and the fan pressurize is at 500 pascals. Now the fan pressurize is something you can customize. I'd like you to keep the fan efficiency at 0.6. The fan pressurize ha has to do with um, how long the ducts are in the building and how many turns they have how much pressure is basically built up between the interior and exterior because that is pressure that the fan has to overcome in order to be effective and it impacts energy use. In the model inputs calculator under fan, there are some basic rules of thumb. So for a central mechanical ventilation system with heat recovery, 
you get a fan pressure drop of about 1,500 pascals. Uh, for a local ventilation unit within a room, like a, a laundry room, um, you get about 300 pascals. And so if you're not sure, then 500 pascals, which I've got here as a default, is, is a good, um, a, a good uh, number to default to. But uh, it can be almost double this, or a little bit more than double this, if you've got a centralized ducted uh, fan system. Now, and so that's, that's um, the extent of my, uh, my occupancy-based ventilation fan. I've got another ventilation fan that is ventilation by area. So what this means is that this is going to be always on no matter what the occupancy is. And you can see that this is actually a much smaller number than this one is, 0 0.001 cubic meters per second per square meter. And notice also the calculation method is different. This is per person and this is per area. So this is always going to be on no matter what. And again, you can set the fan pressure rise in similar way. And there's one last one in this, um, in this class called exhaust ventilation. And right now I've got this off as a default. And this is set to air changes per hour. So this is a different way of thinking about ventilation and um, and what this is is sort of like a purge ventilator it's uh, sometimes known as a whole house fan or in um, large commercial buildings it can be known as an economizer cycle but that what this is is taking outside air and um, and delivering into the building and exhausting hot air so it's an exhaust type ventilation system and five air changes per hour is quite a lot of air that's going to um, really get rid of, um, well, essentially every, what is that, uh, 12 minutes or so, it's going to completely um, take out all of the air in the building. And, uh, and so this is um, the, the exhaust ventilation. This exhaust ventilation here is set to not just, um, so there's a schedule here, and if I turn this always on, then this will always be on, except that this has a really nice thermostat built in. And the thermostat says, uh, will, will give any number of different components here. You can set a minimum indoor temperature, a maximum indoor temperature, um, a different, a delta temperature. So the, the delta between the indoor and outdoor, you always want, for instance, you don't, if you want to cool the place off, but it's hotter outside than inside, you don't want to have that ventilation system on, it's not going to help you. It's going to replace cooler air with hotter air. So you want to make sure that there's a positive delta between interior and exterior. Also, it, you can set maximum and minimum outdoor temperature limits. So if it's really cold outside or really hot outside, you could um, say, I don't want that air in, no matter how bad it is inside. Um, and it also allows you to set a maximum wind speed, which would um, be uh, potentially problematic if, say, you have, uh, well, in this case, 40 meters per second would be hurricane winds, but uh, you could also set it to be a lower threshold so papers aren't blowing inside the building, things like that. We're not going to worry too much about these inputs, but this 22 degrees and 28 degrees are critical because um, it could conflict with your thermostat set points. So if you have a uh, exhaust fan set for 22 degrees, but your heat turns on when it's below 24 degrees, then you're going to be heating uh, the air and then exhausting it. And so you'll see your heating bills go way, way, way up or your heating energy. And the same on the uh, high side. If you set this to be too um, high, then your cooling um, energy will go way up. So. It's, it's important to, to recognize what these set points are relative to your thermostat set points.